I'm just going to give a bit of a talk today. So Liam, as Liam said, I'm, I'm working for NEWA now as a hazard and risk analyst. And, and a lot of the work I do is in vulnerability function development and lately a lot of software development stuff too. But uh, the work I'm talking about today is really based on what I was doing for my, for my PhD when I was with the University of Auckland uh, working, working under Liam. And basically we were uh, working on a comprehensive project to assess tsunami impacts on New Zealand port infrastructure. And, and we're, we're calling it a first principles approach because really we started this project with no information whatsoever. So we kind of had to pull uh, 10,000 different things together from, from, from every different aspect of this, of this project. So I'm just gonna talk a bit about uh, the, the various different parts of that project and, and how it was all pulled together. So just to give just to give a, a brief overview of what we're going to be looking at, this this presentation is going to cover quite a lot of ground. Um, we're going to go through a bit of background with regards to New Zealand tsunamis, uh, the the port uh, infrastructure in New Zealand, and and historic port damage. Uh, and then we're going to look at the various components of the actual research that was done, including the propagation modeling, uh, uh, attainment of tsunami loading characteristics, and the development of structural wharf models that allowed us to uh, generate predictive uh, damage models uh, to be used in important environments in the future. So to begin, uh, New Zealand is obviously in a position where it's subject to impacts from a wide variety of different natural hazards. And over the past 100 to 150 years, there have been something like 40 or 50 tsunamis that have impacted New Zealand to some, some degree. Uh, most of those have been relatively small, uh, but there have been a few that have created uh, Wave, waves along the coast that have been uh, in the meter to three to four meter range. And there have been a couple that have been much bigger than that, but generally the much bigger ones uh, impacted coastlines where there wasn't real, really much of a population. So the, the effects are, are not as well documented and, and, and there hasn't been a whole lot of damage from those. Um, but these these figures just kind of give you an idea of, of the magnitude of, of that threat. So there's there's been quite a wide a uh, variety of uh, tsunami source locations, both throughout the world, and uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a foreign in a foreign sense, it's it's more the South American tsunamis that tend to pose a threat to New Zealand, but also there are quite a lot of subduction zones around uh, New Zealand coastlines that that gen that generate large earthquakes and and have the potential to create damaging tsunamis along New Zealand's coastlines. Uh, and New Zealand is home to. 14 major ports, uh, seven on the North Island, seven on the South Island, and those range from North Port all the way up uh, outside of Whangarei to South Port, which is down in Bluff on, on the southern tip of the South Island. Uh, for the purpose of this research and assessing ports, we chose to look at 13 ports. The one that was cut out, uh, if you'll notice on the table that one's missing, and that's number 10, which is West Port. Uh, the reason for cutting that out is because A, it was the only port that didn't really facilitate international shipping. It was much smaller than the other ones. And B, uh, a few years ago, two of Westport's biggest clients uh, ceased operations in, in, in the area. So since that time, Westport's operations have, have downsized dramatically, even from what they were. Uh, so we chose to kind of write that one off. In addition, the tsunami threat on the West Coast tends to be much less than on the East Coast, so it's not really expected that tsunamis would be doing much damage in that in that particular region. Uh, but we did look at the other 13 major ports, which are all included there in that table. And those ports service a variety of different, uh, different industries, uh, mostly whatever exists locally within that region. Um, but all 13 of them facilitate some degree of import and export. Uh, some, of the, some of the key sites in New Zealand include Auckland, which is the, the primary import port for New Zealand, uh, Tauranga, which is the largest export port. Uh, North Port, which uh, facilitates services to the, to the uh, Marsden fuel refinery, which provides the vast majority of the fuel that we use in New Zealand, including I think 100% of the jet fuel. Uh, uh, and Littleton, which is a key South Island port because it's the only port on the South Island that's of uh, such a size. Uh, and, and so hence damage to Littleton would, would imply that uh, there would have to be some some major rejiggering because you couldn't simply uh, offload uh, offload the goods that are serviced through Littleton to another port in the South Island. Um, but but all of them all of them obviously play a, quite a big role in the region that they exist. Um, and so damage to the to the ports would would have large economic consequences for the regions and and, and for New Zealand as a whole. Now historically there have been 
examples throughout the world of damage occurring to ports as a result of tsunamis. Um, now, as I, as I said in the beginning, most of the tsunamis that have occurred in, in New Zealand have been relatively small. Uh, there, there have been examples of, of larger waves occurring in ports, but, but nothing that's done a huge amount of damage on the structural side at any rate. Perhaps in terms of content damage, there has been a bit more, but, but not really so much in terms of damage directly to the, to the infrastructure. Um, but that's not to imply that it, it, that it couldn't happen. And in particular, because since the last really large scale tsunamis, which, which might be linked back to the mid 1900s, uh, maybe the 1960 Chile tsunami, which, which caused three to four meter uh, uh, wave heights in some of the ports. Today, there's a lot more infrastructure present. Uh, there's a lot more people residing on the coastlines. The populations have expanded. So if the same things were to happen today, I mean, the impacts would be quite different just because of that, just because of that uh, expansion of, of, of the infrastructure and the populations. Um, but to get some idea of the kind of damage that can potentially occur to that infrastructure, we, we've just taken a look at, at what's happened around the world. In particular, there was, uh, uh, the, the big tsunamis that occurred as a result of the 2004 earthquakes in, in the Indian Ocean and the 2011 uh, earthquake in, in Japan that created massive tsunamis that ended up killing a lot of people and doing a, a ton of damage to, to infrastructure in, in many different countries. So just a couple of, a couple of, uh, of, of images of, of the kind of damage that happened to the, to the to ports in Thailand following the 2004 tsunami. Um, the damage here was was predominantly a result of either either very very thin deck members that, that ultimately cracked and, and and gave under under uplift loading or poorly uh, designed connections between between the substructure and the decks. Um, now, in, in looking at this kind of thing, it's important just to note that the design standards in New Zealand would be very different than the design standards in a country like Thailand. So it's not it's not necessarily the case that the same exact type of damage or the same exact degree of damage would occur to our infrastructure, but this is still educational just, just to give us an idea of what kind of damage does occur and, and to highlight the fact that this this is not it's not unrealistic to expect that it that it might happen. I just I just point out this is in the context of the 2011 Tohoku tsunami in Japan, but other other damage modes that that are very very common from tsunami or, or debris impact damage. This isn't something that was really explicitly modeled within this research, but it's something that is quite prevalent, and it's something that in, in, in many tsunami uh, events we we do see this occurring over and over again. Uh, ports contain a lot of loose items, shipping containers, driftwood, uh, uh, vessels. E e even if they're even if they're well well moored, uh, they can still they can still cause quite a lot of damage if they break free of their moorings or if they're lifted by excessive wave heights or excessive current speeds. Uh, just, just because there aren't large wave heights doesn't necessarily imply that there won't be strong currents, which can still do a lot of damage on the debris side. Um, and, and that's obviously something that, that probably has to be thought about in the future as, as, as an aside, just from the direct structural damage to the, to the, uh, to the structures. So, with some 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 background, um, the research that, that we took upon ourselves was to try and develop uh, damage relationships for port infrastructure as as they relate to tsunamis of various different magnitudes. And ports are quite complex and, and quite diverse in the types of infrastructure that they that they inhabit. Uh, obviously, one port is not the same as a, as another, but but most ports. Kind of contain some degree of core infrastructure, and and one of the one of the core bits is is obviously a wharf. Uh, if if the wharves go down, then the ships really have no way of of berthing and, and and unloading and loading and all that. So that's that's kind of one of the one of the key bits of infrastructure within the ports. And because within one PhD that that lasts even a few years, it's it's impossible to look at every different bit of infrastructure within that port environment. Uh, we made the decision to kind of focus in on on, on the wharf infrastructure for this particular work. With, with the assumption that, of course, we can go back later and kind of look at the different bits and pieces and then try and pull all of that information together to do a, a full port assessment. But for the time being, it's, it's limited mostly to that uh, wharf infrastructure. So in order to predict damage and impact on the wharves, we really need a few different pieces of information, and that involves infrastructure data for the port itself, uh, inf information about uh, kind of predictive tsunami models, uh, and then we need something that pulls those two things together. So loading characteristics uh, and, and vulnerability models that basically tell us 
Okay, if a tsunami of this height occurs, then this is the amount of damage that we would expect to see in that in, in that port, given that this type of infrastructure exists. And all of that comes together in, in, into, into a damage model or an impact model. Now, this is kind of an aside. Um, and and I, I realize that I'm probably talking to quite a lot of, of civil engineers here, so this, this might not be anything new, but uh, just just on the off chance that there are some who who, who aren't um, there's, there's a few different there's a few different types of damage functions that you can that you can develop and what we really did within this work was to develop uh, sort of deterministic damage functions so basically we, we took a tsunami of a specific uh, wave height and then tried to link that to a specific degree of damage that would occur as a result of that wave height uh, the alternative and and what is more ideal in in some situations but much harder to develop is is a fragility function whereby we would have a tsunami of a specific wave height and we would link that back to probabilities of damage so for example for a specific wave height we would say there's x probability of damage state one occurring to a structure x, x probability of damage state two occurring to a structure etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, but developing that kind of probabilistic model requires quite a lot more information than we were able to obtain. So deterministic damage functions are, are, are kind of the, the, the best thing that we could come up with. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of go into the modeling side of things now and, and start by talking about the first of three different components to this research. And the first component of that was to do prob propagation modeling. So New Zealand does have kind of nationwide assessments for tsunami risks. Uh, this information was taken from a GNS uh, science report from 2013. Um, and it, this, this kind of information is good for assessing uh, general risks around the coastline of New Zealand, um, but for assessing specific infrastructure at specific sites, it's not uh, incredibly useful because the uh, the resolution of the data, uh, especially in this particular report, was was at 20 kilometer intervals. So in other words, the maximum wave height within a 20 kilometer chunk of coastline was what was used as, as, as kind of the risk to that entire 20 kilometer section of coastline. And that means we can't really drill down into any details and specific sites. Uh, we kind of need more localized results. So in order to obtain those localized results, which which don't really exist for all of these different sites that we were trying to look for, uh, the first step in this in this research was to conduct a, a pretty comprehensive set of propagation modeling, uh, specific, specifically for each of the port sites that were that were mentioned, uh, the 13 port sites that were mentioned in the, the second or third slide in that table. Uh, so a propagation model is just a model that predicts wave heights and current speeds for various different locations. Uh, and in order to come up with that information, it really requires two pieces of information. You need to have an accurate bathymetric map and you need to have some sort of seismic source model. So you basically create an earthquake, that earthquake creates a tsunami and then the, the, the trail of that tsunami is, is kind of tracked back to the location where you're, where you're interested in modeling. And for our purposes, these models were run with COMMIT, the uh, Community Model Interface for Tsunami, although there are a number of different hydrodynamic models that you could use to do this. Uh, so the first step in developing these propagation models was to develop uh, kind of high resolution bathymetries for the different locations. So this is an example of what that looks like for Centerport in Wellington. Uh, and these grids are developed on, on, on three different levels because Commit uses a, a, a model consisting of nested grids, whereby when the tsunami is far away from the source, it, it operates on a, on a coarser resolution. Uh, and then as it closes in on the target, the resolution gets finer and finer and finer until it until it finally uh, hits hits the area we are uh, specifically interested in. So we modeled 500 meter grids for the for the for the coarsest uh, level, 150 meter for the for the intermediate level, and then 10 meters for the for the location specifically inside of Wellington Harbor. So in the end, what we what we came up with were, were 10 meter tsunami uh, 10 meter resolution tsunami models propagation models. Uh, and the second bit of information that's required is, is a source is a source model, a seismic source model. So the the determination of, of what sources we would be using really came from that from that work that GNS did. So we kind of picked out the source locations that were most likely to create large tsunamis at each of the port locations. And obviously they're different for each port location, so diff different one, ones were modeled. Since this work was done, there's, there's been more work done uh, in this context and, and to kind of draw out this work. Uh, so 
each of those port locations has been expanded to different sources. Um, but for the purposes of the research that I did for my PhD, we, we, just, uh, we just chose one distant source location and one local source location that, that were most likely to create those, uh, those large uh, tsunamis. And in terms of the magnitudes of the earthquakes, instead of trying to pin it down to ARIs, which is quite imprecise, uh, basically for the, for the local source locations, we just ran, um, I think, magnitude, uh, moment magnitude 7. 7.5, 8, 8.5, and 9.0. Uh, and for the distant source locations, we just uh, ran earthquake magnitudes of uh, 8, 8.5, 9, and 9.5. I think it was, which was generally based on based on the modeling that was done before, was kind of the upper and upper and lower limits of what would be expected to actually occur. And and on the lower side, what would actually produce any any kind of noticeable waves within the harbor environment below below moment magnitude 7.0. The, the models don't really produce any any noticeable wave characteristics inside the harbors, so we're not really expecting to see much in the way of impacts on the infrastructure there. So what was produced by those propagation models were uh, plots uh, indicating the maximum wave heights within those port environments. So this is a couple of examples of what that looks like, specifically for Prime Port on the South Island, uh, along, along the east coast of the South Island, just south of, uh, of Christchurch. Uh, down in Temeru and in the port of Marlborough, inside the Marlborough Sounds on, on the northern tip of the south of the South Island. And those assessments were run for each of the each of the 13 ports that we were looking at in the North and South Island. So these plots are indicating the, the maximum water levels within those plots uh, for each of the 13 ports as they relate to the local source scenarios and the distant source scenarios. And there were certainly a couple of things that jumped out. Uh, there were there were certain ports that were certainly getting getting smacked around a bit more than others, specifically on the South Island, uh, Littleton and Prime Port. The the ports sitting on the east coast of the South Island are, are are really potentially exposed to distant source tsunamis that are being generated along the South American subduction zone. Um, they're creating almost uh, six meter uh, waves inside of those port environments, which which would certainly be enough to do quite a lot of damage in there. Uh, and for the local source tsunamis, uh, it's it's mostly the, the ports lying on the east coast of the North Island because the Hikarangi subduction zone is right off of that coastline. So uh, a, a, a big rupture along there would create potentially in excess of 10 meter uh, waves inside of uh, places like Gisborne and Napier, uh, East Eastland Port and, and Port of Napier. And in line with the with the water level, with the wave height assessments, we also assessed current speeds. Uh, so those those plots look quite similar. Uh, the difference is the wave heights tend to be a bit more distributed throughout throughout the the port environments, and the water or the current speeds tend to be more concentrated in areas where you have kind of choke points. Uh, what you see in, in in both the cases of North Port and South Port, they kind of exist in protected harbors, which which tends to mitigate the wave heights a bit. But it also creates very, very quick currents coming into the harbors. So, yeah, I, I guess again, coming back to the point that just because you don't have massive, massive wave heights uh, occurring in the port environments doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't high current speeds, which can also do quite a lot of damage. And the same kind of uh, summary, summary statistics for those uh, current speeds. Um, the, I guess the thing to point out is is it's not necessarily the same ports that see the massive wave heights as that see the really high current speeds. Just, yeah, so coming coming back to the same point, even if you don't expect to see the massive wave heights, those current speeds tend to be much more distributed throughout the different ports. So there's 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 great potential for damage to occur just as, just, just as a result of those things. And so just a, just a summary of, of the results for different ports. So yeah, Napier and Eastland look like they're potentially at the greatest risk of tsunami damage, just based 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 solely on the on the hazard side. And then on the, on the other end, Auckland is is relatively protected from the from the Hikarangi uh, or from the Hikarangi and and the Kermitic uh, trenches uh, because it's enclosed within the Haraki Gulf Islands and and nothing seems to be getting through there. And there's several other ports that tend to lie on the low side, Otago, Taranaki, uh, Nelson, uh, Northport. Um, obviously, risk is kind of a, it, it's kind of a culmination of both the hazard and the potential impacts 
Um, so it's it's important to kind of consider both of those things when assessing what the what the what the risk is really to those ports. Auckland's risk of of the tsunami actually uh, being enormous inside of the Haraki Gulf Islands might be relatively low, but but the impacts to Auckland, if it ever did occur, would be would be catastrophic, and the same with some of the other ports here. So moving on to the second part of this research, uh, after the propagation modeling, uh, the second phase was really to try and attain uh, quantitative tsunami loading characteristics for tsunamis of different uh, hazard magnitudes. In this case, the, the hazard metric that was really evaluated was, was wave height. Um, and fortunately, there's quite a few design standards that actually uh, evaluate tsunamis in terms of their wave heights and, and, and serve to estimate that kind of loading. Uh, in general, tsunami loading is, is very complex and therefore inside of design standards and inside of research, it's usually broken down into a number of different components. Um, and those components kind of exist in two phases. So there's kind of an initial impact phase of tsunami loading. And then after that, there's kind of a sustained hydrodynamic loading phase um, that tends to be much lower in magnitude, but drawn out over, over a long period of time. And I guess another way that you could really break tsunami loads down is, is via horizontal and vertical loads. So obviously there are gravity loads from water coming down on the top of, a, of, of an elevated structure like a bridge or a wharf, for example. Um, and, and then there's horizontal loading like the hydrostatic and hydrodynamic load of uh, side of things and, and wave slam and all of these different things. And a lot of the design standards that exist, um, which are, are now, now quite old, I guess. <laughs> There are, uh, there are kind of newer ones being published, but a lot of the ones that were being used for, for the PhD uh, were, looked at, were looked at quite a long time ago. Um, but a lot of those design standards tend to take into account more the horizontal loads than the vertical loads. So for example, all of these different ones, uh, the, uh, the coastal construction manuals, uh, the, the Honolulu building code, uh, and design of structures for vertical, vertical evacuation from tsunami, uh, they're very good at providing estimates for things like hydrodynamic loading, uh, horizontal hydrodynamic loading phases and, and, and hydrostatic loads and, and the initial impact and all that kind of stuff. But where they tend to fall down uh, is, is on the vertical and specifically the uplift loading. So this is, this is particularly important in the case of an of, of a infrastructure like, like an open wharf, for example, because the water flows underneath the wharf and rises quickly and then creates very, very high magnitude loads on the underside of that, of that structure. And in, in the figures that were shown earlier from, that, uh, from, from the tsunami impacts in Thailand, you saw some of, the, some of the deck members being completely destroyed as a result of that loading on the underside of the deck. So it's not something that kind of can, can really be overlooked, but I guess the issue is there just hasn't been as much research done into that field, which means the design standards don't have design standard equations to kind of apply to that, to that loading phase. But obviously that doesn't mean that it can be overlooked specifically within the, within the context of this research. So in order to fill in those gaps, um, there was a comprehensive set of, of laboratory testing that was done in order to try and come up with estimates for that sort of uplift loading. Um, so I'm, I'm, showing a, I'm showing a few pictures here, and some of this is just uh, to indicate how much, how much fun the University of Auckland has been having with their, with their new tsunami, uh, uh, tsunami flume. Uh, there's, there's been a huge variety of infrastructure that's undergone uh, uh, tsunami loading uh, characteristic testing. Um, but I guess the ones that are, that are, that are really of interest in, in the context of ports are, are, are the wharf testing, which again was done specifically for the purpose of coming up with that, with that, those uplift load magnitudes, uh, and I guess also of, of interest in the, uh, in, in the port context is uh, sort of the, the, the rubble mound breakwater and the seawall uh, assessments as well. Uh, there was there was a series of testing. This wasn't actually done by me. This was done after after me, but I, I figure it's worth mentioning just in the context of ports as well. Um, but there was a series of testing that was done to assess the impacts of tsunamis on rubble mound breakwaters as well to uh, assess the the displacement of the of the rubble mound um, of, of rocks or or whatever whatever happens to be making up that that structure and and the damage as a result of of tsunamis of different heights. Um, but the work the work that I was doing in 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 the test uh, in, in the laboratory uh, many, well, se several years ago now, was uh, basically building, building small scale model uh, open style wharf structures and then, and then testing to figure out the, the uh, loading characteristics on the other underside via the, via the uplift loads. 
And so what we came up with was a, a, a series of tsunami loading series, um, time series based on the load magnitudes that were come up with uh, based on that, based on that uh, testing. So we came up with a time series that consisted of an initial impact load and then kind of a steady state hydrodynamic phase that flattened down after the after the after that period of time. And what I'm going to talk about next is the structural models that we that we developed uh, that consisted of a series of piles and, and, and a deck and, and pile cap. Um, and the way that these time series were applied to these structural models was was it, it was intended to be as consistent with with what we thought would be would be real as possible. So this time series was first applied to the to the leading pile on the wharf, and it was subsequently ap applied to uh, the piles further back. Uh, and and the timing of that impact was staggered based on based on the travel time to each of those piles, which was relatively small, of course, when when you're talking about a tsunami that's moving at very high speeds. But still, in order to try and try and uh, model reality to the to the best possible extent, that that whole kind of travel time thing and and the staggering of those load series was still taken into account. So for the last the last phase of this work um, on 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 the on the infrastructure side was was the development of uh, wharf models, structural wharf models, and this was done in a program called Open Seas. I'm sure many people here are probably familiar with Open Seas, but that's Open System for Earthquake Engineering Simulation. It, it's basically an open source uh, structural model based on uh, the TCL programming language, um, and it, it it allows for quite a lot of customization over over the structural models that you develop. Uh, so this this image just shows kind of kind of the base model that we were using and and some of the uh, some of the modeling characteristics that were that were applied for for different components of that model. Uh, there were a lot of there were a lot of different components that were taken into account in the development of these structural models, uh, including geometric characteristics like the deck width. It's the pile lengths, uh, the pile uh, section characteristics, the sizes of the bays, uh, the slopes, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Material characteristics like the reinforcement, uh, the cover and core concrete, core concrete being modeled via a confined concrete model. Uh, soil properties, including we, we tested for, for clay and, and sandy soils, uh, and then various different loading characteristics, including static loads, which are relatively easy. Um, and then, of course, the tsunami loads that were that were taken from that from that uh, laboratory testing. Uh, in the end, these these models there there were a number of different kind of variations of of this base model that were created, and they were kind of attached to different time periods based on uh, design standards. Uh, so a lot of the information that was taken and and put into this into this uh, model development was was gotten from the ports themselves. Uh, a lot of the uh, wharf characteristics, but the information that couldn't be obtained because let's face it, a lot of these ports date back to the 40s, 50s, 60s. I mean, I mean, some of the information doesn't exist and, and, and some of it just, just can't be obtained. Uh, so the information that couldn't be obtained was, was taken as best as possible from design standards or from uh, literature, from papers that have been published in the past. Um, and it, in the end, there were, there were Different, ver various different, uh, various different kind of variations of, of that base model that were developed for three different time periods based on when the design standards went through major, major variations. Uh, therefore, kind of changing the the way that that infrastructure would would respond to the to the tsunami loading. So the results of that structural modeling was was analyzed in two steps. The first, after applying the tsunami loading to the to the structures. The first thing to do was to look at individual elements within that structural model and, and assign damage states to those different elements. And these damage states were intended to be kept broad so as not to uh, create this kind of over certainty associated um, with, with something into which there were a lot of assumptions going. Um, but basically there were four damage states that were defined and, and then assigned to each of those elements and those included elastic which in, in which case there was basically no damage to that particular element. Uh, the second was was uh, once uh, the concrete began cracking uh, and then the last two indicated damage to the to the reinforcement and, and therefore much much higher levels of, of stress and much higher levels of, of damage potentially occurring to those particular elements. And after we assigned damage states to each individual element within the wharf, we developed kind of comprehensive damage states for the entire wharf structure. So those, again, included 
phases where there wasn't really any damage to the to the wharf, where the damage was relatively low, and then once once the once the reinforcement in in various different members of the of that wharf started to either uh, yield or fracture, then then it, it went into much much higher damage states, uh, and and the damage states for the wharves. We really looked at, at at members, and and they were based on kind of the worst element damage states that existed within that member. And and that was done. This is this is one example of what that looks like. But that work was done for each individual uh, wharf uh, wharf model. So just just some just some final thoughts before I before I finish up. Um, this this kind of first principles framework. There's there's a lot of work that went into this because again we kind of started with no information and there was a lot of information that had to be pulled together, both on the tsunami side of things and and on the port infrastructure side of things and and then coming up with the tsunami loading characteristics. It's 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 a very useful way of pulling that kind of information together and coming up with these with these estimates. Although it's certainly not the only the only way of of, of potentially doing this work. Um, there's a lot of possible sources of vulnerability and damage data. Uh, we now, now, now that I'm, I'm working for NIWA, we regularly do uh, field surveys related to uh, flooding or storm surges or, or various different things, and we found that that's quite a useful way of coming up with damage data uh, related to natural hazards. Um, but I mean, obviously, this this kind of modeling side of things is, is another way. In, in the event that that kind of information isn't available, um, I, I mean, it's not it's not exactly every day that you see a tsunami occurring in New Zealand, and therefore, it's it's very difficult to obtain. Uh, a, to obtain any kind of information from actually going and looking at the infrastructure following those 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 kinds of those kinds of events, so we we kind of have to rely on on other methods. Um, and then of course there's literature that that's 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 also published based on based on past events. Uh, there's a, there's a great difficulty in determining ARIs and AEPs. So a lot of this work is is focused in on there's a tsunami of a specific height of, of a specific hazard hazard uh, uh, metric magnitude, and that kind of links to a specific damage state. But then the question that's always asked, of course, is, okay, well, what's the probability that that tsunami height is actually going to occur in that environment? And the answer is, well, that's a very difficult question to answer because that kind of probabilistic modeling is is, is very, very uncertain and, and, and very difficult to come up with because we simply don't have the record to, 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 be, to be all that certain about it. Uh, and, and finally, while, while there's been a lot of work done in this. In this, there there is still ongoing work to try and improve some of these assessments, uh, especially to improve some of the structural assessments that 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 are currently going on in association with NIWA and the University of Auckland. And, and so, some of this work will be will be kind of updated in the coming in the coming months. And with that, I, I, I thank you for listening and for the opportunity to uh, to present some of this some of this work. And and I'd be happy to take any questions. Hi, Ben. Um, I just want to say thank you for a great presentation. Uh, Liam Watherspoon had to step out, uh, so I'm going to lead the question session. This is Andrew Stolte from uh, Quake Cortex Platform 2. Okay. So, uh, any questions? Please unmute yourself from Zoom. Hey, Ben. It's Ben here from Golda. It was a really good presentation. I just um, wanted to ask about, you said you tested a few different magnitude earthquakes, from like seven and a few diff different other magnitudes. Are there any other parameters that you have to put in, like fault displacement or fault maybe the direction of fault displacement or is it just a magnitude um so if i go back uh there there are various different parameters so i i, I mean I'm, I'm framing this in terms of the magnitude but i think the model the model the way the propagation model actually works is based on the the size of the slip plane and and the degree of and the degree of slip that actually occurs in that plane and then it, it actually uses that kind of information to calculate what the approximate magnitude of that earthquake is. So it's not that you're putting in, it's not that you're that you're directly putting in a, a moment magnitude. It's kind of that that's an offshoot of the information that you're putting in. But I, I when I when I when I do this, I, I usually indicate those moment magnitudes just because it's something that's quite relatable to to uh, I, guess, I guess just about anyone. Um, but no, it's 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 based on it's based on it's based on a few different parameters related to those related to those earthquake events. Yeah, and then is that to get it to wave height? I guess at that source, is that an empirical relationship from fault slip to wave height, or is that physics based? Uh, um, that's physics based. Okay, cool. Thank you. I am half here. I have to. I have to host two meetings at the same time, which is pretty stupid of me. Any other questions for anyone? Yeah, I've got one. Um, hey Ben, Kaylee Crawford Flat from University of Canterbury Quake Centre. 
Um, I am continually facing an issue where we have kind of industry wanting empirical data and you know you briefly mentioned about the challenge of in um, kind of verifying models and actually obtaining you know tsunamis don't happen every day in New Zealand um, and obtaining that perishable data or being able to capture an event when it happens. Um, I also like your comment about coming in on a first principles approach because you're kind of starting from scratch. Any comments on a way forward? Um, we look through the literature and there are there are you know papers everywhere on models but very very few uh case studies any comments on that in your field well i mean i think i think from our perspective it it, it seems like we're, we're doing this work and we need to be really upfront about what the uncertainties are associated with this work and the fact that it is it is a model and and, and models obviously have a role to play in indicating kind of what the general what the general uh, uh, risk is associated with certain things but it, it, it should never it should never be taken for more than what it is I mean it's not something that's going to produce an absolutely positive positive uh, potential outcome and and I, I just think when, when we're presenting this information back I, I, I think we need to be very open about the fact that this is this is this is probably the best we can do based on the information that we have because as, as you said you know these events don't occur that often so it's very hard to corroborate it's very hard to validate this kind of information but for, for the time being, I mean, we do we do have we do have various different components here: structural models. We do have propagation modeling, that and you know each of those each of those individual components has kind of been validated to some degree. So th there there can be some 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 good faith that the information that's coming out 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 of this is is at least useful in the sense that it's 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 informing it's informing you know in a, in a, in a general in a generalized kind of sense, but. It's 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 definitely not kind of the end all be all, and it 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 needs to be taken with that context that there is a lot of uncertainty associated with it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I think that's a very important part, and and if it's possible to do any kind of uncertainty assessments, I, I mean, that's a very very difficult thing to do in most projects, and and uh, especially based on the information that we have. But it, it's 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 best to try and to try and capture that as best as possible, but but at least to, at least to indicate where specifically that uncertainty lies in, in order to provide the best kind of and, and, and most comprehensive picture. Hi Ben, uh, Mark Stringer here from uh, University of Canterbury. Uh, one of the things I was interested in is, um, you know, what's happening elsewhere around the world, um, sort of west coast of the USA uh, and Japan are obviously two places that spring to mind. Um, and the US has got a lot of uh, research money being pumped into it through the NERI program. Uh, which is the extension of Nice, uh, specifically looking at uh, tsunami hazards. So I was interested to know uh, what the approaches are like um, elsewhere in the world. I, I'm not. I'm not 100% sure, to be honest. I do know that the infrastructure in different parts of the world tends to be quite different. In the U.S., it tends to be a lot more, uh, especially in the types of infrastructure that, that that I was looking at. It tends to be a lot more like key wall type structures, and the ports are are, are configured a little bit differently than they are in New Zealand. Um, I, I, I do know that there's been quite a lot of, of of tsunami assessments, especially in the West Coast ports, because they they do tend to get they do tend to get hit quite hard. For example, in the port of Long Beach. Up in like Crescent City, they tend to get hit quite hard when there's a tsunami. So I, I do know that there's been quite a lot of money spent on on tsunami assessments inside of environments like that. Whether any actions been been taken in 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 response to that, I, I, I'm not I'm not 100 sure to be honest. Thank you. Great. I think we're probably at about time with the presentation, but I would like to first thank for, thank the audience for their good questions and thank Ben for that really interesting presentation and looking forward to see how things develop. Thank you very much.